Welcome back everybody for lecture number two of our online format and in today's lecture we're going to cover chapter five. I think I covered part of chapter five already and I did it oh, several weeks ago and so today I just want to see what I missed and so it'll be a short lecture and uh, we'll just go over an accomplished chapter five and uh, so let's see if I open up five it is crime <clears throat> and so I know I started this lecture at some point, I just don't think I ever finished it. Um, and so it's on the agenda for today. So crime, and this is of the gift of fire by Sarah Bass. Um, what I talked about before was hacking and ethical hacking, black hat, white hat hacking, and all sorts of different types of, of, of um, hacking and natures of hacking. Uh, but this will look at the black hat, which is the unethical hacking version of it. Um, identity theft, credit card fraud, scams and forgeries, fighting crime versus privacy and civil liberties, and the laws that rule the web. <clears throat> Are there really laws that rule the web? That's a, that's a good question. So we should all know what hacking is at this point, currently defined as some ways of gaining illegal and unauthorized access to a file, computer, or a network. And we've already known from the midterm that there's um, at least three, possibly even more, goals to hacking and the goals to hacking are either to obtain something that you don't have privilege to obtain that means take something with without privilege um, unauthorized or it might be to steal um, to um, take something without paying for it um, you know to obtain money uh, or property of some sort um, and then another common um, goal of hacking is to change data um, change it, make it uh, so it's not real, like hacking into a network system and changing your grade to an A when you really had an F or something. Uh, the other, I mean, another way of hacking, um, it was also maybe to deny service, doing a de denial of service attack um, on a network to take a service down or to prevent users from being able to use a website. That's also hacking. So we have, hacking has many different goals to it. The term has changed over the years. In phase one of 1960, 1970s, it was a positive term. In fact, a hacker was glorified and the hacker was a creative programmer who wrote an elegant and clever code. And then a hack was a especially clever piece of code. Well, it's not so clever these days and it doesn't have the same glamor. So around the 70s to the, to the 90s, it took a negative connotation to it. Breaking into computers, uh, you know, they don't have authorized access to, um, stealing uh, primary, primarily individuals' information, um, you know, spreading computer worms and viruses, phone freaking. And you all watch the videos on that, the Discovery Channel video, and the companies that began using hackers to analyze and improve security, well, then that's when ethical hacking came out. Um, so beginning around the mid 1990s, the growth of the web changed, viruses and worms became more uh, easily spread, uh, political hacking, uh, hacktivism uh, surfaced, denial of service attacks, large scale theft of personal information, identity theft really became a problem in the 90s. So we have this hacktivi hacktivism eh, versus political hacking. So the use of hacking to promote a political cause. Um, well, we, some of us saw this in the last election, actually. Hopefully we're not gonna have the same thing happening again. So there's a little disagreement about whether it is a form of civil disobedience or how or whether it should be punished. Um, some use of the appearance of hacktivism uh, to hide other criminal activities. Yeah, some use it to hide other criminal activities. Some use it to force uh, political agendas, to, to uh, spread fake news. It's used in a lot of different ways. Um, but, you know, how can you determine whether something is uh, vandalism uh, or whether it's hacktivism? So that's um, still controversial, very controversial today as well. Um, so the, the problem hasn't gone away. It's just gotten a little bit worse. So the law, what does the law say on that? Uh, catching and punishing hackers. Well, we know from the assignment number one, as well as from uh, some of the readings that you've done already, that um, you can go to jail. Uh, there's def definitely penalties these days. It's not a glamour. It's a, it's a, it's a crime. So in 1986, Congress passed the Computer Fraud 
and Abuse Act. And again, you don't know the, need to know the dates and you don't need to know these acts, but you might be curious in knowing them. Um, it covered, uh, this act only covered government computers, uh, financial and medical systems. It's still in place today, actually. Um, and uh, it, activities that involved computers that were more in one state. So if it uh, was on the internet or network together, uh, then uh, it covered it. So then also the U.S. Patriot Act expanded the definition. Um, so and the definition of the loss to, uh, and included loss to include the costs of uh, responding to an attack. So any damages that were occur occurred from the um, hacking activity um, could be recapped and it could be regained. And part of the damages included all of the cost of prosecuting as well as um, fixing the issue. And so a variety of methods for catching hackers were put into place. Law enforcement, uh, you know, they try to catch hackers. They, they, they surf online, they prowl around in forums and on blogs, and they, they, they read what's out there. They join groups, news groups and things, and they try to get involved to uh, impersonate essentially one of the members of the group. Um, and then, you know, they find out, uh, they make friends, they find out who's there, and then they investigate the people. Um, so you could, you could pretty much be uh, trapped in from a chat room from an undercover police officer. You never really know who you're talking to online, and it's, I guess, a form of catfishing. But, uh, yeah, the police are out there. Uh, there's a special unit, actually, out here in San Jose. There's a special unit um, for that. Uh, so looking through archives, looking through online um, activities, security professionals, they set up these honeypots, which are websites that attract hackers to record and study. You know, it's like putting up... Um, yeah, it's basically putting up a sign. It says, come here, come to my website. I'm here, and I have, I have pictures of this. I have pictures of that. Uh, it drags people in. Those are honeypots. It drags people in and, um, you know, kind of attracts them. Uh, so computer forensics is also used uh, to retrieve evidence from computers. And I will have a little bit on computer forensics, um, actually, in my next lecture. Um, so the penalties for young hackers, well, in the beginning, you know, they got a slap on the hand. Now they go to jail. And many young hackers have uh, matured and they've gone in. And now they're doing productive and responsible careers. Um, so the temptation to over or under punish uh, still exists. Um, it depends on the intent, the damage is done. Uh, most hackers receive probation, community service, and or fines. It wasn't until 2000 that a young hacker actually received time in juvenile detention. Um, a lot of the hacking community is young um, because they just haven't grown up yet. They're, they're too much immature to realize that what they're doing is really a crime. In terms of security, the internet has uh, started to open up access to the means of sharing information for research, um, you know, so copy infringements and patent infringements and all sorts of different issues come up with that. Attitudes about security were slow to catch on. Um, People, it took people a while, and it took until the news actually started on identity theft before anyone realized that well, maybe we shouldn't be giving out our personal information online. So firewalls can be used to monitor and to filter out communications for untrusted sites. I don't know. So security often plays a catch-up. It does. A catch-up to hackers. It seems like something happens that's wrong or that, 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 that's damaging, and then we respond to it. And then something else happens, and then we respond to it. And then something else happens. And it, it just it seems like an endless battle. Uh, because really, when it comes to the internet and um, security, it's kind of a wait and see what happens kind of approach, or has been for a while. It's hard to be proactive to predict what might happen uh, in this type of environment. So the responsibility for security well, usually it's the developers that have the responsibility to develop security. Um, it should be part of the goal of the software design. It shouldn't be making software that's not secure. If you go back to the IEEE or the ACM, Professional Code of Conduct, um, developers have security built into one of their responsibilities. So businesses also have the responsibility to use security tools and monitor their systems to prevent attacks. And um, that would be like, you know, Target making sure that their credit card services and their online server um, isn't 
um, allowing other people to log into it to get the information. It's not leaking information. Home users have the responsibility to ask questions and educate themselves on tools, maintain security, uh, personal firewalls, antivirus, anti-spyware for, for years, you know, it's, it's up to the individual to actually install spamware, uh, anti-spamware, um, virus protection, stuff like that. So some hacking questions for consideration is hacking. Is hacking that does no direct damage or theft a victimless crime? Ah, that's a good question. Um, in fact, that one's got some ethical issues associated with it because you're not really doing any crime or are you doing a crime? And is it a victimless crime if you're not hurting anyone? And um, if you're gaining unauthorized access and you're getting something for free or you're doing something to, to see information that you're not supposed to see, I would actually argue and say, yeah, you, um, there's no victim, but it's still a crime. And maybe the victim is the company. So do you think that hiring former hackers to enhance security is a good idea or a bad idea? Well, some of the former hackers actually have turned into ethical hackers. And so I'm actually in support of, of that actually as a thought, because I think that hackers make really good ethical hackers um, in the end. All right, so unless you just crawled out from under a rock, identity theft is still a problem. Various crimes. Uh, large groups of uh, users um, uses the identity of unknown innocent people to do things, use credit card numbers, personal information. 18 to 29 year olds are the most common victims, believe it or not, because they use the web the most and are unaware of the risk. And so part of the problem with the internet is education. Um, not only educating people that what you read might be fake, but also just because you're giving out your information uh, doesn't mean that your information's safe and that the person that you're giving the information to isn't handling it correctly or may, may not be handling it correctly. So these are things that people should be aware of, but they're not because they trust the internet. And uh, also e-commerce has made it easy to steal card numbers and use it without having a, the actual physical card. In fact, in the old days when you had a credit card and if your credit card company saw that the card was used in many different states, um, they might come back and, uh, with some fraud detection and say, how could you be in Florida and Virginia at the same time, you know, five minutes apart, I see a transaction happening. But when you think about it, if you're doing online commerce, um, you might be purchasing in different states five minutes apart. And so that red flag that would have been triggered in the old days isn't really worth anything right now. Um, so it really can't be used. So and it's hard to detect fraud online, bottom line. There's many different techniques used to steal people and uh, personal and financial information. Uh, the common one that we see a lot of is the phishing attacks. So email phishing for personal and financial information, disguise of legitimate business emails. You know, it's like the, um, you know, oh, your Gmail account needs updating. Please log in to your Gmail account and you provide your Gmail name, your address and your whatever, and your password and you log in. Or the PayPal. Your PayPal um, security needs to be updated. Log in here. And when you're, you're really not logging in, you're just giving your information. Those are called phishing attacks. There's farming attacks where you have false websites that fish for personal and financial information by planting false URLs in the domain name server. So you're going to websites that are picking up the information without knowing that you're actually going to those sites because they've uh, put in these URLs that are wrong. Uh, that lead you into different directions um, or online resumes and job hunting sites that may reveal social security numbers, work history, birth dates, and other information. So sometimes even legitimate websites actually expose your information. Um, you signed up for a service and now your information is available and it's showing to the public when maybe it shouldn't have been showing to the public because if you think about it you're relying upon the website to keep your data or the with, with the web managers or you know website people uh, to keep your data safe and how do you know what they're doing with your data and sometimes it's done by accident sometimes it's just done by negligence or you know or just people who are not informed or don't know that they should not be exposing your full name and your social security number or something like that anyway also um 
More techniques might include activation for new credit cards when you uh, have a number, and this is co actually kind of common too, when you call up a credit, you know, you get your card in the mail, and there's a number on the back, and you call it up, but you accidentally mis misdial it by one digit, and then someone's bought that number, and they're using it, and they're impersonating the credit card people so that, you know, you're giving out, what's your card number? What's the expiration? What is the three-digit code on the back? You're pretty much verifying through a fake verification because you got to the wrong number um, and they're coll collecting your information instead of verifying it. Uh, retailers you know, print the full card number um, on the expiration card, uh, which is good. Um, these are ways to protect, you know. Um, I used to just, just use that first bullet point, the activation of new credit cards. Yeah, it's supposed to protect you, but it doesn't always protect you, by the way. Um, especially if they're pulling one of those scams with the, with the number that you're calling to verify with. And that's why uh, you probably want to make sure when you dial that number, when you're activating the new card, that when you dial that number, it is actually going to the correct number. Um, and activating a new card and going through that authentication makes the card active. It's kind of a shame if you send a card in the mail and it's already active, uh, which some companies still do. Um, so that's not really protecting you very much. So if you want to be protected, you don't want those cards activated until you receive it. And yes, you shouldn't be printing out full credit card number information expiration dates on receipts. And banks shouldn't be doing that on ATMs either. And then maybe a software might detect unusual spending activities. It will prompt the retailer to ask for identity information. Um, I know that Amazon actually doesn't do that. Um, and maybe they should. Um, after you've made like five or six purchases in a row, it still takes it and takes it and takes it and will just purchase, purchase, purchase. You could just be somebody else with somebody else's card and somebody else's account. Um, but I guess it depends on where you're sending the product to. I mean, if you're sending it to the person who owns the card, um, you know, that's kind of a, not really a problem. So services like PayPal act as third party, allowing customers to make purchases without revealing the credit card information to a stranger. Yeah, PayPal is a great service. It does cost you a little bit. Um, so there's minimal charges, but uh, PayPal is a nice way of paying for something online. So, so responses to identity theft. Um, well, authentication of email and websites, um, you know, authenticating through third party um, houses. So if, for example, if you use your credit card online, there should be a third party authentication for the credit card services so that, um, the website isn't, uh, isn't stealing the information or the information is not being sent unencrypted. So using encryption for security to store data, it's also a good idea. Um, so it's useless if it is stolen, authenticating customers to prevent the use of stolen numbers. Um, so you might have to trade some convenience for security. Um, so in the event that something is stolen, a fraud alert can flag the credit card, credit report. Some businesses will cover the cost of the credit report if the information has been stolen. Um, some businesses don't. Uh, so it really, really depends on what type of information was stolen as well. Now, if we really want to get secure, we can use biometrics. So... Well, what does that do? And your, your eye retinas, your fingerprints, um, your facial recognition. So what do you, so it's characteristics that are of the body, um, biological characteristics that are unique to individuals. And there's no external card keys or anything like that that can be stolen. Nobody can steal your eye retinas. Well, I guess they could pop your eyes out, but that would, that would not be, that would not be very feasible. And used in areas where security needs to be high, such as identity and uh, identifying airport personnel. Um, yeah, I'd love to see biometrics used actually at the airport. Um, it can be fooled, but it's difficult. Um, so uh, especially as uh, more sophisticated systems are developed and they're getting better and better at it, the biometrics makes for a fairly decent level of security. So I could probably ask a trivia question and say, what's the worst level of security, the worst form of security on earth? And I take a few minutes and think about that one. What is the worst form of security? Well, passwords. And what do we use the most to secure everything? Passwords. So we haven't really gone that far. 
So if password protection is the worst form of security possible, and password protection is what we always use. Um, you go to any website, you have to put a password in. Even the school website, uh, anything, you have to put a password in. But password protection is so weak, it's ridiculous. Um, I mean, it's not even worth using in some cases. Um, and why is that? Because it's easy to crack passwords. Passwords are very insecure these days. Even if you make them strong, um, they're, it's still pretty bad. It's a matter of time. The difference between a weak and a strong password is about five minutes. So it depends on how many attempts and how long you want to spend trying to decrypt it or trying to break into it. So some identity theft and credit card fraud discussion questions. What steps can you take to protect yourself from identity theft and credit card fraud? Well, as Barbara Bush would say, just say no, or what did she say? Stay off the internet, or I don't know who said that, but yeah, just don't do it. Just don't, uh, I, Barbara Bush didn't say no to drugs, I think that's what she said. Um, long story short, uh, reframe from giving out your information, I guess. Well, that's my answer to it. And how uh, can you uh, distinguish between an email that is a phishing attempt and an email from a legitimate business? Well, actually, it's very difficult these days. In fact, um, I've been fooled a couple of times. Uh, but you have to go back and you have to think about the logic. For example, the Social Security Department will never send you an email. They never call you either. They always send you a letter in the mail. But if you don't know that, you might get an email from the Social Security Department and it actually looks pretty legitimate, but it, it really isn't. Um, usually it's like uh, knockoff brands. You can sort of see like fake logos sometimes, and sometimes they're using the real logo. Um, so you really actually have to cross check and double check everything you receive these days. Otherwise, um, well, uh, you might have some issues with, uh, or some identity theft. So, all right. So scams and forgeries, auctions. Um, so the Federal Trade Commission, which is the FTC, reports that online auction sites are one of the top sources of fraud complaints. What's an online, what's the most popular online auction site out there? Do, do, do. eBay. eBay. And yes, there's a lot of fraud on eBay. Uh, there's a lot of illegal product, stolen product. There's a lot of um, auction scams. Um eBay's full of problems. Some sellers do not send items. You know, that's, a, that's, that's another problem. Or send inferior products or used products. I would say one out of the 10 things I buy, if you buy something new on eBay, be warned, it's probably not new. It's probably a used product that somebody's selling as new. Um, the problem is you can't really see it. You, know, you can take pictures of it and stuff, but how do you know that the pictures that you're looking at are really the pictures of the object that you're actually purchasing? Shill bidding uh, is used, artificially raised prices. Yeah, actually people come in, uh, you're trying to sell an item and what they do is they create about, you know, a hundred other accounts and then they log in under those other accounts and they, they inflate the price by bidding on it. So you can see like, you know, 25 people are bidding on it, you know, and oh yeah, you want to come in next, but there's really nobody bidding on it. It's just all fake bids. Sellers uh, give themselves or friends glowing reviews to get, you know, to, to garner customer trust. Yeah, it's kind of like a Twitter, uh, excuse me, um, Yelp reviews. Um, in fact, some eBay um, sellers actually pay people to give them glowing reviews, just like they pay for the Yelp reviews. So auction sites use various different techniques to counter dishonest sellers, but it doesn't catch all of the dishonest sellers. There's still a lot out there. Click fraud. Well, that's repeatedly clicking on an ad to either increase a site's revenue or to use the competitor's advertising budget. Well, what does that mean? Well, that, you know, if you've ever heard of Google ads, have you ever seen those um, little pop-up ads that come up on all over the place for like university? The University of Phoenix used to do it a lot. Uh, I'm now at Southern New Hampshire University and a couple of other ones. They show up in these little ads and you click on it for more information. Well, the company actually has to pay per click. And so if you're at another school and you're um, a competitor and you're trying to raise the budget or excuse me, um, cost the, let's say it's SNHU and you're trying to, um, you know, increase their marketing expenses. So you just keep 
clicking on their ads and they have to pay a dollar for each time you click and um, yeah that uh, is kind of weird and so you're basically burning through your advertise your the advertising budget of your competitor um, so you're costing the competitor some money get some stock fraud the most commonly method to buy a stock low send out an email urging others to buy it and then sell the pr- and then sell it when the price goes up usually only for a short period of time it's kind of like what's happening lately with the uh, coronavirus in the stock market and there's a lot of scams going around with that um, where people are encouraging people to sell and then they're buying and then they're counteracting playing games with people's emotions about the coronavirus and what's going on in fact uh, just last week um, Actually, I bought some stock last week because I'm like thinking, oh, the stock market's going to go right up as soon as, uh, you know, as soon as this happens, as soon as that happens, you know. And then sure enough, um, yeah, the market is recovering. Uh, but, you know, at one point people were selling and selling and selling because, oh, my God, you know, gloom and doom, the market's going to crash. People are funny. Um, not all of it's fraud. Some of it's just prediction. When it comes to the fraud, it's people deliberately sending out emails and deliberately sending out fake news about things so that they can fluctuate the price for their advantage. So, digital forgery, new technology scanners and high quality printers used to create fake checks. Oh, that's a good one. Passports, visas, birth certificates uh, with little skill and little investment. Well, uh, popular one that's going around the bay area right now is the secret shopper um you get a you you sign up to become a secret shopper and uh, what do you get to do well they send you a check in the mail it's a fake check you take the check over to best buy or to apple and you buy prepaid cards and then you email or you text message the card numbers to the, the the scammer and so you deposit the check into your bank account, and lo and behold, it's a bad check. But it looks like a good check. So that's a digital forgery of a decent check, you know, with a real bank account number, real everything. And it passes through all the checks, but the check doesn't clear at the end when it goes to the original bank because um, it's not, um, not a legitimate check. So it wasn't drawn on the check owner. It was drawn by, a fra- uh, by someone who's committing fraud. And so, yeah, and then if I, maybe you've also heard about the, you know, I'm sure you've all heard about the, the Nigerian prince. Um, yeah, who needs to be bailed out of something. Uh, or the man in the middle, check frauds, and wire transfer frauds. So it's pretty much on a rise these days, actually. So Search and seizure of computers. Well, here we got how we're going to fight crime. We're gonna, so we have crime fighting versus privacy and civil liberties. Do I want someone coming into my house and taking my computer and seizing my property? Why? Because they thought an email message came from my computer. Can the government do that? Actually, the government can do that. Uh, so it requires a warrant, though, to search and seize a computer. And the court ruling, rulings, um, whether or not uh, you know something found on a computer is covered by the warrant. Uh, is this computer in plain view? So there's, there's, some, there's some court rulings in there um, in terms of what can be searched. Um, it really has something to do with the warrant. Um, automated searches can be done, can monitor constantly, less likely, to miss, less, likely, less likely to miss suspicious activity if you're monitoring something. Um, can be programmed to look for what is covered in the warrant. Um, so anyway, so searching, automated searching on the computer itself, um, taking a computer or a notebook computer. So, you know, in the day that, in the old days when we used to use desktop computers, it was a big old box and a monitor and stuff. It's really hard to grab that. Uh, it's much easier to take a notebook computer, seize that and, um, take it into the headquarters and search it. So there, uh, goes county by county. There's no generic ruling or law that says it's okay for them to take it. Usually they have to have a specific warrant looking for a specific item on the computer. So the issues of venue, especially on the internet, when, where did the, the law get broken? What state was it in? Well, I bought something online and I bought it on eBay 
And the person who sold it to me never delivered my product to me. Never, never gave it to me. So I'm in California. The person I bought it from was in Texas. Um, what, what venue? Where did the transaction take place? Um, that's, that's a problem. What laws govern it? So charges are generally filed where the crime occurs, but where did the crime occur? So it differs between state and the country. So the laws can differ and the charges can be different and significantly impacted by the community standards that apply in the area. So the FBI usually files in the state where the crime was discovered and the investigation began. And so if it began with an example of my California, I live in California, I bought something on eBay, then the California law, the FBI would take the California law, even though I purchased it from somebody who was in Texas. Anyway, the cybercrime treaty. And cybercrime is actually, there's a, a major, so you can actually get a degree in cybersecurity and cybercrime. And so it's a hot, hot topic these days. So we have international cooperation among law enforcement agencies. Uh, from different countries to, um, and they're, they're pri primarily battling copy infringement, copy and infri uh, pornography, fraud, hacking, other online fraud. Um, and so the crime, the cybercrime treaty basically promoted cooperation to help each other investigate issues and to solve problems and prevent issues that happen internationally. So it sets common standards or ways to resolve international cases. So. So in the digital actions cross borders, we have some problems. Uh, and whose laws rule the web? Well, that's another interesting question. They vary from country to country. Um, the United States it does not actually have the strictest laws. Sometimes the European laws are a little bit more strict. Corporations that do business in multiple countries, they have to comply to the laws of all of the countries involved. So believe it or not, most people think the United States has got the strictest policies. Believe it or not, we're pretty weak compared to everybody else. So someone whose actions are legal in their own country may face prosecution in other countries where the action is illegal. And that would come with, um, you know, when I think about that, I always think about the Canadian drug sellers. Um, in Canada, you can actually sell pharmaceutical drugs without prescriptions because they don't have the same U.S. prescription system. Um, so in that, in, in regards to controlled substances and drugs and pharmaceutical products, the United States is stricter than a lot of other countries when it comes to the drug industry. In Canada, you can buy anything you want, um, and the uh, phar pharmaceutical values of it is pretty much the same. I mean, it's it's the same same types of drugs, the same companies, yada yada. Sometimes cheaper actually because it's not as regulated. But if you're an internet shopper and let's say you don't have insurance and you buy from a Canadian company and you get, uh, I don't know, penicillin or something, or I don't know, you get something you need you know, to, to cure whatever ailment you have, it's legal to buy them in Canada, but it's not legal to have them shipped to the United States because the drugs themselves cannot be sold without a prescription in the United States. So if they can't be sold in the United States, they can't be delivered to the United States. So a lot of drugs are actually stopped at the border. So a lot of people do buy drugs online and they never receive them. They pay the company, the company sends them, but then customs picks them up and, uh, you know, doesn't deliver them uh, because they are illegal. And the company in those particular cases could or could not, depends on the prosecution and what's going on, there's no obligation for them to refund you any money and the U.S. person who bought it because you committed an illegal act because you live in the United States and you're supposed to buy drugs at pharmacies in the United States. Well, your illegal act isn't going to get you a refund. And then the companies that are selling it to you, well, they're doing it wrong as well. So there's a lot of wrong things with that. Then we have the arresting of foreign visitors. So we had a Russian citizen was arrested for violating the DMCA when he visited the United States to present a paper at a conference. His software was not illegal in Russia, but it was illegal in the United States. That's kind of tricky. That doesn't happen as often. That This D DMCA was, uh, uh, mm, I was going to say this about 10 years old, uh, this, this particular case that uh, is, is being referred to here. Um, 
but yeah, if the software is illegal, um, then yeah, you can be arrested, especially when it's not illegal in your home country. It depends on where you're bringing it and what you're doing with it. If you're a Canadian citizen and you buy drugs online, you haven't done anything wrong. If you're a United States citizen and you bought drugs online, you have done something wrong. So the same, the same concept applies. An executive of a British online gambling site was arrested as he trans transferred planes in Dallas. Online sports betting is not legal in Britain. Yeah, it's legal in uh, it's legal in Dallas, Texas, but it's not legal in Britain. So, and he's a Britain citizen. So online gambling, yeah, he should be arrested. Uh, so, anyway, it depends on, uh, a lot of factors go with that. It depends on what country you're talking about. Libel speech and commercial law. Okay, so there's some differences there, too. Even if something is illegal in both countries, the exact law and the associated penalties may vary, and you might actually get charged twice in both areas. So, there, where a trial is held, um, is important not just for the differences in law, but also the costs associated with the travel between the countries. So, yeah, it could take some time to come up and come up, come to trial, and then maybe require numerous trips back and forth. So, let's say you were um, charged in Canada. Let's say you crossed the border. You went to Niagara Falls, crossed the border into Canada, bought some drugs, and there's some border drug companies that actually allow you to do this. And then they catch you on the border, coming back in the United States. And then they set a trial date for you, and you have to go back three times, which means, and let's say you just live in California, so now you got to drive or you got to fly all the way back and forth three times for your trial dates. It could get expensive. So the freedom of speech suffers if businesses follow laws of the most restrictive countries. It does. Um, so when it comes to that last bullet point, the freedom of speech, when it comes to, if we want to, you know, narrow everything down to be safe and follow the laws of the most restrictive countries, then we really can't do anything. I mean, we really can't say anything about our products. We really can't sell anything either. So, so regarding the discussion questions about laws that rule the web, you know, what suggestions do you have for resolving the issues created by the differences in laws between different countries? I can't even answer that question. Um, it still hasn't been resolved today. This is one of the areas of the legal system that is still unresolved. Um, there's no solution yet. So maybe one of these days in the next 10 years or so, somebody will come up with a solution for this that's fair. So far, everything that has been proposed has been shot down because it's not really fair to everybody. So what do you think would work and what do you think would not? I can't even answer that question. Don't know. I have no idea. So, all right, so this uh, concludes the chapter on crime, and uh, as I suspected, the PowerPoint and the book chapter covered a slightly different information than I had covered already in the lecture, um, and so I'm glad I went over this. So uh, hopefully you found this interesting. Uh, there's a lot of issues on the internet. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, this is one area, when you think about crime and computer technology and the internet, it's one area of the law that's not sophisticated yet, that is not, um, it's still behind the times, it's not kept up with technology, and I think this is where most of our issues are today. Uh, most of the problems that we have with the some of the world issues that we have outside of the coronavirus has to do with the fact that uh, we have so much fraud and so much identity theft and issues going on on the internet that um, it's hard to control it. And it's impossible, and even when we find, it's hard to prosecute, and it's hard to charge people with crimes. And as the same token, it's hard to be fair. So usually uh, the law in the United States kind of, you know, errs on the extreme side. They like to put people in jail and then figure out later, oh, well, I guess you haven't done anything wrong, and let them go. So, so stay out of the, stay out of hacking, and uh, you won't end up with that problem. So I hope you've enjoyed the lecture, and um, that's all for today, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.